we are back. Senators, twins, baseball, past, present, and future. I'm Ralph Tycho with the Comfortably Zoned Radio Network, apologizing to the hosts and the guests for my tardiness this morning. <laughs> Welcome, gentlemen. The, ho- the co-hosts are Ronnie Rabinowitz, Rabinowitz, uh, George Case the Third, and Chad Rubin. How are you, gentlemen? Just fine. Great. How are you doing? Uh, other than I can't pronounce your name for 40 consecutive weeks, Ronnie, um, okay. it's a V, okay. not a W. Um, <laughs> but no if, problem. if you make you feel better when I introduce Ian Kahanowitz, I invariably <laughs> put a V in there. So um, yeah. my, right. my grandmother would no be problem. very proud. Um, uh, gentlemen, uh, we'll start with George because he's going to introduce our returning guest. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I am happy to uh, have uh, Alan Feinberg back on the podcast with us. And Alan was on a few weeks ago, and we were going to discuss Roy Sievers a little bit today and uh, the fact that uh, Alan has told me many times that Roy Sievers is his favorite player. And I just thought that uh, Alan might want to discuss Roy's uh, baseball career a little bit and how he, you know, became interested in in Roy and and his career and also uh, Washington baseball. Alan has been a huge Washington memorabilia collector for many years, and uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing Alan for quite a while, and, and I'm going to turn it over to him, and we're glad to have you back, Alan. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, George. It's a pleasure to be back with you, gentlemen. Uh, speaking about my favorite player, and at 68 years old, I can still say that. I first <laughs> uh, became uh, acquainted, uh, in a sense, with Roy Sievers in uh, about the 1956 season as a, uh, a fan living in the Washington, D.C. area. Got used to uh, checking out the newspapers and listening to games on WWDC radio, and occasionally they'd have things on WTTG Channel 5 for uh, local viewers who might remember those old call letters. And the senators were known as first in war, first in peace, and last in the American League from an old vaudeville gag. And uh, often it was true. Of course, they had many great years, but... uh, One of the cool things for kids growing up in any particular era is latching on to somebody that you can look up to besides uh, uh, your parents or family members or uh, anyone else like that. It's often a sports figure. And I was lucky that it was uh, Roy Sievers because uh, he embodied humility, strength, uh, a good nature, a friendly smile, and uh, when you met him on a, a personal level, you, you couldn't top it. Just a, a decent human being in, in every way you can think of. Well, he has started out with the St. Louis Browns, and like Joe Garagiola, who came from St. Louis and started with the St. Louis Cardinals as a hometown player, Roy started with the St. Louis Browns and grew up in St. Louis, so it was another hometown boy makes good. He was the 1949 Rookie of the Year. And uh, something you don't hear about all the time anymore are sophomore jinxes. But in 1950, he did have a big sophomore slump. He did come back later on and return, had some slumps, but he brought his uh, batting average up uh, for the Browns. And when sent down in the early 50s during a slump, he suffered a very serious shoulder injury. And he ended up going to Johns Hopkins University in a hospital in Baltimore and was taken care of by a doctor there who saved his uh, athletic career. Roy had been primarily a left fielder, occasionally playing third base, but his doctor recommended that uh, he be very careful and uh, when Bill Veck took over the Browns, he said, uh, you should play first base. It will be less of a strain on your arm. And Veck worked out with him personally, 
hitting balls to him at first base to uh, get him to become familiar with the position. So he uh, very much during the remainder of career was known as a first baseman. When uh, yeah, Beck left base... Some, let me just Beck. interject something very interesting. We don't hear of Bill Vick being a uh, baseball development guy, uh, on-field on guy. We hear of his promotions, his genius, his uh, uh, being right there with uh, crossing the line, what with Larry Doby and, um, and Hank Thompson. Uh, shortly after Jackie was was signed, but I just want to say how interesting it is that Vec, um, uh, learning that that Bill Vec was involved in player development and um, had his head in the game in that manner. Absolutely, yeah. He he took it all very seriously, and uh, Seavers felt that that made a big difference in him being able to prolong his career. Uh, oh, then after, af, yes, after uh, Vec was kind of uh, ousted in the move that sent the uh, Browns to Baltimore and returned baseball to Baltimore after a half century, uh, in the beginning of the year, February 18th in uh, 54, Calvin uh, Griffith made a deal with the uh, new owners of uh, the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, and they traded away Gil Cohn, who uh, was a very fast outfielder, had a couple of 300-hit seasons. And uh, the word in Baltimore was Jimmy Dykes, who felt that uh, he hadn't, uh, that uh, Seavers hadn't rehabbed his shoulder, and he would be a liability and wasn't going to uh, continue his career. So they gladly made that move, and it was one of the most lopsided trades. Uh, in history of that period of time or comparing players because uh, Seavers went on to play an additional 12 years and Cone was finished after uh, another 414 games. Oh, interesting. You know, Alan, Alan mentions uh, a couple of people that I just wanted to, you know, discuss for a minute. Uh, number one, Alan, do you recall who the, who the doctor was at Johns Hopkins that operated on Seavers? Uh, that's a good question. I think it was a, a Dr. Bennett, if I'm not right. mistaken. That, that's why I wanted to ask you, because Dr. Bennett also operated on my dad's shoulder. Uh, when wow. my dad had a shoulder problem at, at Hopkins in 47, and, and Bennett operated on him, and they tried to prolong. My, my dad wasn't able to come back, but they tried to prolong my dad's career by taking some, some muscle out of his um, out of his leg and, and putting it into his uh, shoulder. And it was experimental, but... You know, uh, Dr. Bennett, and that's why I was curious, Dr. Bennett was world-renowned as uh, back in those days as an orthopedic surgeon and operated on quite a few uh, professional athletes. So, so Dr. Bennett was the same uh, doctor that operated on Roy Seavers as well as my dad. Then you also mentioned George, Gil George, Cone. how old was your dad when he retired? When He was, he was only 31, um, and that's Whoa. why they tried to, you know, prolong it because the shoulder uh. injury – precluded him uh, able to throw and at 31 and he was really in the prime no of his DH at that time forced to retire. no DH no back then there was no DH and uh, you know my dad had to be an everyday player and uh, his speed and he, when Alan mentioned Gil Cohn my dad did have a race against Gil Cohn in 46 at Griffith Stadium and, and my dad beat him in front of General Eisenhower and and as Alan mentioned, uh, you know, it was sort of a lopsided trade because Gil Cohn was very fast, didn't really have power, and here he winds up uh, being traded, and, and Roy Seavers, uh, you know, goes to Washington and has some wonderful years, and, and Gil Cohn uh, was almost at the end of his career. So it was interesting for me to, to hear that. And, uh, Alan, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but uh, you just had Not at all that I wanted to discuss. Hey, I didn't mean to interrupt both of you, but I want to ask you if modern medicine would have extended your dad's career, George. Yeah, I'm sure it would have. Uh, you know, back then, uh, you know, a lot of the players had to self-medicate. I know my dad used to have to wear a <laughs> – he created a, 
a rubber inner tube around his uh, thigh, around his hamstring, because he was always pulling his hamstring. So he, he tried to do that himself before they had compression shorts like they do today. And when it comes to surgeries, I mean, it was pretty, really fairly primitive at that time. Today, the modern advance, you're talking 50, 60, 70 years later, <clears throat> certainly probably could have prolonged his career. But back then, it was a experimental surgery. And uh, unfortunately for my dad, it didn't work out because he, he just wasn't able to, re, you know, to re, restore the, the movement in his arm and, and really couldn't throw anymore. And so that was the end of his baseball career at 31 years of age. You know, George, what with the stats that he put up um, – and only being 31, if he could have played another six years, uh, he could have made a case. Ashburn got in. Um, I don't know if Ashburn got in because of his uh, announcing career, if that had anything to do with it. But um, he easily could have put up stats that would have been Hall of Fame um, worthy. Well, you know, some people have said that to me, uh, uh, Ralph, and, you know, it, it could have been. It, it was my dad's uh, career was, was short. Um, he only qualified for a Hall of Fame consideration because he, he played 10 years, and that's, and that's the minimum uh, for a Hall of Fame. Uh, they have made a few exceptions. Lou Gehrig was one. But the fact is that I think my, my dad, if he had been healthy, certainly could have put up some better numbers. His last year – in Washington, uh, he was hurt and only played probably 30, 40 games during the season and hit 150 and, and really was not able to function at all. So, you know, the last uh, couple of years were uh, ones that hurt his numbers. Prior to that, his numbers were very good and uh, when he was in, in pretty good health. But when you're an athlete and you're forced to retire for injury at, at 31, it's uh, it's quite a blow because you're really at the at your peak uh, years of both production as well as earnings. Now your dad had this sporting goods store. Did he have it while he was still playing? No, he opened it the year he retired. So uh, he had the sporting goods store in Trenton from 1947 to, to 1960, and and he was in the sporting goods business where some other Matter of fact, some other uh, major league players were in sporting goods as well because it was a natural, you know, move from the athletic field to, to dealing in, in athletic goods and services. And, and my dad had that sporting goods store in Trenton for 13 years. Yeah, and a lot of ball players had hardware stores and sporting sporting goods stores because they, the material, like, um, if they had to go away, and they would to play ball, when they came back, it wasn't spo- there was no spoilage in material. Right. So, um, yeah, and again, back in the days, people don't remember, ball players had to work <laughs> in the, in the winter time. Um, well, they did. They did have to work. And and when you mentioned ball players, and Alan, you might re- recall because he's in the Washington area, but he didn't he didn't play for Washington, but he played in St. Louis with George McQuinn. And George yes. McQuinn and my dad were very good friends, and George McQuinn had a sporting goods store in Virginia uh, at the same time my dad had his sporting goods store in Trenton. Wow. Very interesting. Um, Absolutely. You told me something a while back, because one of my favorite all-time musicals was um, was the movie about the Damn Yankees. Damn and, Yankees. Uh, I loved it. When Verdon... Um, yeah. It was tremendous. I think of her a lot. Oh, yep. Leggy, all that stuff. Makes you think. Yeah. Roy Walton as the devil. But was not, did you not tell me, George, that um, when that Roy Seavers was the character of Joe Hardy? Well, you know what? I was thinking about that, Ralph. And, and, and Alan, I think, will we'll clarify that. Uh, Roy Seavers was the interspersed in the film damn yankees uh for joe hardy when uh, tab hunter was playing the role but roy seavers was interspersed in there with action shots of hitting home runs so i think i was mistaken and i said something about it was modeled damn yankees and joe hardy was modeled after roy seavers but actually it was roy seavers uh portrayal within the the movie itself hitting those home runs. Alan, is ah, that the correct, he did, as far as you understand? The, he played the, the, he was a double. 
afterwards. Uh, yeah, well, in, in a sense, uh, the uh, he was uniform number two receivers doing most of his career, and uh, Tab Hunter wore uniform number two in the movie, and you see Seavers hitting a home run and running around uh, the bases. The fact that it was uh, Hannibal Joe from Hannibal Mo, uh, and uh, Roy Seavers was from St. Louis, Missouri, uh, does make you think twice. And yes, uh, absolutely. The, the timing uh, that the book uh, was written by Douglas Wallop, uh, it very easily could have been. And uh, I think Seavers felt a great deal of pride about that possibility and the fact that uh, he was seen on screen. Hey, check out, everybody out there, you got to check out on YouTube, they have Gwen Verdon and Tab Hunter in the locker room with that fa- that uh, very famous, whatever Lola wants, Lola right. gets, and whatever. <laughs> Terrific show. With the wa- actual Washington uniform, the W yep. um, right in place, um, and it is pretty cool. Given Washington's position generally last in the American League, as, as you said, um, back in those days. Anything about Seaver that we don't know, we as, uh, me as, I have to admit, kind of a casual fan of Washington, until I met George, um, uh, and now I'm uh, couldn't be more interested in, in his career and the people he played with and against. But um, anything we don't know about Roy Seavers as as fans that would surprise us? Well, I think that a lot of numbers have been eclipsed over time. Uh, One thing uh, for Senators fans is that he was the first Senators player to win a league uh, home run championship, and that was in 1957 when he hit 42 home runs. That particular year, he came in uh, third in the MVP balloting. He also uh, led the league in RBIs that year, and if batted 301, quite a bit distant to Ted Williams, and Mickey Mantle had come in second in the voting that year in 1957. But those were some high water marks for Roy. He he had uh, four years in a row where he eclipsed his record as uh, franchise leader in home runs for the Senators. And when he uh, was finished uh, as a Washington Senator, he uh, ended up with 188 career home runs. It was surpassed by... Uh, Frank Howard, and now uh, franchise-wise, Ryan Zimmerman, and the Washington Nationals uh, is tied with uh, Howard in the, in that regard. Well, is uh, it, yeah. that, are they really the same franchise? Well, it, it's uh, stretch it's splitting hairs. It it it. Be, it uh, begets a lot of uh, attention and criticism. Is a franchise based on the city or on what you can trace back? Uh, the the Senators uh, started as the uh, Washington Nationals in 1905. They, they entered the American League in 1901, but in 1905 there was a contest, and they uh, took the name the Washington Nationals, even though the sports writers called them the Senators. In 1956, the uh, name became uh, actually the Senators. And in 1960. You would have to include, on your statistical analysis, you would have to include the Joe Hinton years. As well, yeah, I, the 50, 1901 to 1960 and 1961 to 1971 both the name Senators or if you want to think of as Washington baseball franchises. So there's a lot of controversy on that. I'd like to think of it as Washington baseball. But, yeah, I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to mention one thing about that. And, and with Ron, I mean, with Ron and, uh, and Chad, I believe, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I believe the Washington National Senators 
records are combined with the Minnesota Twins records. Is that correct? Yeah. Or the, they're combined with Montreal. The, well, the original 1901 to 1960 senators, their records went to Minnesota. The legal right. name of the senators, uh, of the twins, up until Carl Polad bought them from Calvin Griffith, was the Washington American League Baseball Club, even from 1961 to 83. And I didn't so know that. that. Very yes, I didn't the, know that either. The. Uh, <clears throat> Expansion teams, 61 to 71, uh, the Texas Rangers assumed their records. And, and the I can't, current Washington... I can't fathom them having anything to do with the with franchise Texas. that went until 1960. Um, and I've thought about it a lot because in putting together the name of this show, um... I decided on uh, Senators Twins, and right. what does that encompass? Well, I'm going to get Denny McLean to come on, who is not a, a senator and not a twin, but um, he's promised to come on. But he was a Washington senator, and that's close enough for us, um, Right. These airwaves. Well, you know what, Robert? Let me just say this one thing about, you know, and I sort of am involved in this because of my dad and the fact that the Washington Ball Club, the Washington Senators were known, as, as Alan mentioned, they were known as the Nationals, and they also were called the Senators. And that was the name that was, was used for many years. And then in 19, I think it was in 56, when Calvin had assumed the uh, – Ownership. The the name was formally uh, changed to the Washington Senators. So, and then when the twins, when the old Senators became the Twins in 1961, the expansion team became known as the Washington Senators. Same name, right. same city, but a totally different franchise. The the huh. you know the club in the 1961. Was a, was made up of draft uh, veterans and older players, and really came in about the same time that the uh, Angels came into California in the expansion years. But but if you trace the the roots of the Washington Senators in Washington, that's when it dates back to the 1900s. But the Washington Senators expansion team is what dated from 1961. Absolutely. Correct. So those records really, I think, in, in official baseball records, they're separated. And when Montreal came in in 69, I think the current Nationals, I think they really began in 1969. And their records are combined with the Expos and um, not with any Washington team previous to to uh, themselves. Well, there's been some From controversy a, about the, and, and Alan, you, you've been at the stadium, and, and I know that that they had a Washington, I think they call it the Ring of Fame or something like that, and that included some some Montreal players because the yes. Montreal team had, had relocated from Montreal to, to Washington. But, you know, as some people have said, you know, they don't believe that those names should be included because those players never played in Washington. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, I, uh, well, not so much because they never uh, – yeah, they never did play in Washington, but yet San Francisco honors the New York Giants. The Dodgers honor the Brooklyn Dodgers. Right, so, because it was, it was a direct move, Ralph. It was a direct move from New York – to L.A. or from San Francisco, uh, New York to San Francisco, where the Washington situation was not a direct move. And I know as a, uh, as a fan who <laughs> grew up a Senators fan and lost the team twice, personally never felt good about Montreal losing a team and the fans who lived there or supported them. I'd like them to keep their records. So hopefully they will get and expand or some other team. Yeah. Ab absolutely. I mean, it's it's tough for kids growing up to lose their team and sure. uh, well, tell me their about traditions. It. I was 10 when the Giants left New York. 
I was heartbroken, <laughs> really. Truth to, yeah. Seriously, I was really uh, – there are rabid Dodger fans. There are very few Brooklyn Dodger fans, very few rabid New York Giant fans uh, by comparison. But the ones that are, like uh, myself and a number of my friends – I mean, that really hit us hard. You, you were a 10-year-old kid. You lose your team. You lost your team yeah. twice. Um, yeah. That, that that can't be easy. Now, I got, have to ask, because Ron Rabinovitz has <laughs> been gloating this week because his yeah. Brooklyn Do- his L.A. Dodgers, Brooklyn Dodgers, that's Freudian, um, beat the Minnesota Twins. Um, Did they ever? Yeah, uh, it, it was kind of have, a. Have like I do when the Giants play the Mets. There's always that twinge of, um, well, you know, I root for this team, but that's my boyhood team, whatever. Yeah. Even though you're a day to day living in Minneapolis, day to day you see the Twins, and it's been years <laughs> since, since the Brooklyn right. Dodgers, since Jack. Still root for the Dodgers. That's how fandom is, and I. Um, That's right. That's right. I mean, I love uh, the Twins, and I'm glad that they're not in the same division <laughs> with the Dodgers, <laughs> because I'm very happy to see the Twins win. But uh, when they're playing the Dodgers, I have a loyalty that goes way before well, the Twins. Ryan, you, you must be happy, obviously, with the with the Dodgers. And I wanted to ask Chad, how are you feeling uh, with the Twins? They've done great so far. Uh, it, it's been a rough week. They lost a tough That's one last been a night. Very rough week. Boy, Chad. Very um, rough week. Yeah. Um, they lost last night on a walk-off home run. Um, so it's been a rough yeah, week. Right. It's going to be interesting in the next 24 hours if they move anybody in the next 24 hours. Yeah. I read in the paper this morning that they're now going to be sellers. That's what they're talking about. Uh, they were, they were thinking they were going to be no. buyers. A week, 10 days makes all the difference. Oh, my God. This was Dredge a terrible it. week for them. They could very easily have been buyers um, yeah. two weeks ago, say. Um, yeah. You know, Chad, I'm, I'm curious uh, with, with baseball. We've always talked about baseball and the fact that, uh, you know, it's a long season and, and the fact that uh, the Twins, uh, you, you mentioned a couple of weeks ago that they're – we're a little short on pitching. I guess it's starting to show up now because, uh, you know, when the pitchers are usually ahead of the hitters early in the season, but then when you get into yeah. this part of the season, the, the hitters really catch up. And, and if you're not really yeah. strong in the pitching department, you start to struggle. So uh, I don't know because I'm not following it, but I have to assume that's what's going on with the Twins now. Yeah, their, their pitching has just fallen off over the last three, four weeks. Um, Santana, who's supposed to be their ace, his last ten starts, his ERA is over five. Wow! So yeah, they've gone. They've this gone guy, they brought this. They brought this Garcia in uh, for their bullpen, and uh, I've heard today that they traded him to the Yankees. So I think they're they're thinking that, that they're now the sellers, not the not the buyers. Right. Um. So there could be some big trades or nothing at all. I don't know. I, I, that's 24 you know, hours you guys have mentioned, Chad especially has mentioned, there's not much coming up, so maybe this is a godsend. Oh. Maybe they um, stock up the minor leagues a little bit. Um, could, be, could be that they were um, – they wouldn't have really – because pitching has been so thin, had they uh, stayed hot, I don't think they would have advanced very far in the playoffs. So no, maybe, it's no, no, no. I remember they were really I young the right back there. Does, does that make sense that maybe sell, being sellers and picking up some um, uh, A-ball a prospects, maybe double-A prospects uh, for a year or two away, um, could be could be helping them more in the long run? Am I right? Right. Yeah, I, I think that's the right attitude to take when you're a young team. Let's try right. to get rid of the veterans and let's keep bringing in young guys. Listen, they have a yeah, like Chad said, they have a very young team, and uh, they're they're going to move. They're going to 
uh, go places. They're just building. And even if they uh, continue to fail right now, their um, their season has been a success because of last Absolutely. year they lost 102 two wins or something like that. So, hey, being swept by the Dodgers, I, I'm a Giant fan from way back. Yeah. i got to give the Dodgers a lot of credit. They oh, my God. They are a solid team. It's no disgrace oh my God. To, to lose to them. And um, But it's just interesting how um, wins in these last few weeks leading up to the trade, not just the Twins, not just uh, the Mets, uh, Dodgers, uh, makes all the difference. What, who has been the biggest surprise on the upward side, Chad Rubin, uh, for the Twins this year? Well, Sano became an all-star this year, which has been, you know, it was projected of him, but, you know, it's one thing to be projected and it's another thing to actually do it. And Barrios, the young pitcher, has been lights out a lot of times. Um, while they both have lots of talent, you never know when they get to the majors. You know, a lot of these guys who have all this talent flame out. So, so that's been the nice thing. They've had two guys that look like they're going to be uh, perennial all-stars going forward. Beautiful. Beautiful. Hey, this has been a terrific show. Um, hey. uh, we got, uh, I'm not saving the – almost saving the best for last because uh, this go this transcends – Baseball. This is friendship. We talked about yeah. this a little off air with Ronnie Rabinovitz. Uh, <laughs> you like that, Ronnie? I got the V in there. Yeah. Good time. You know what? Either way, it's fine. Out of 27 <laughs> times, can, yeah. is that I'm on the 090. Right. I'm on, <laughs> on the highway. But your dear friend, when I say it transcends baseball, yeah. she's your friend. She's Rachel she Robinson. She's a Hall yep. of Famer. She's a Hall of Famer. Isn't that wonderful? It's it's so she was well. Always a Hall of Famer. Jackie would not have have made his journey, um, his successful journey, without Rachel. Without right. was absolutely, it was a partnership. He, it really was. And yeah, she was such had an a, integral had to have part. Somebody to come home and talk to. Right. Without it yeah. all, he was too sensitive. For the for the role, and to be honest with you, I think it consumed him. And I think he died at fifty, fifty three years old. Fifty three years old. Yep. I mean, yep. I'm almost twenty years older than when he died. I know. I when, know. When, when you Me think too. about it, um, yeah. And that, and basically, he gave his life to the cause because they did it. Yes, he did. He had to internalize. Yes, he did. So much in those two sure years. Sure, he did. The pressure um, he had. Oh my God. Yeah. No other human being could have. Your other cheek policy. No you. other human being that I know of could have done what he did. Right. It was just unbelievable, but it cost him his life. There's no yeah. question about that. It, um, Rachel is a magnificent, magnificent lady. Um. I'm so proud of Tell her. Tell me the circumstances about her getting into the Hall, Hall of Fame. Is it a, well, uh, like with announcers a, with the Board Frick Award? Is There was a new know. award um, set up for Buck O'Neill, uh, like a humanitarian award. And uh, she is the third or fourth recipient of that Buck O'Neill Award. So she is the first, they are the first husband and wife that are in the Hall of Fame. That's never well, happened I gotta before. i got to tell you, the Buck O'Neill Award would be nicer yeah. if it came with Buck O'Neill being in the, in the Hall of Fame. That's right, which is a travesty. It's terrible. And it's so totally. He should be in there. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's uh, she's right. a magnificent lady. Just wonderful. And she's I'm so in, proud of her. And um, it's the award, a new award yeah. system. Um, yep. Hey. Really nice. She's going to have a plaque, plaque? Yep, yep. Oh, wow. Yeah. She made a beautiful And I might add to that Bill King was inducted over the weekend. Bill King is uh-huh. a, an Oakland uh, Bay Area announcer. He was the Raider announcer, the A's uh-huh. announcer, and the um, Raiders 
A's and the Warrior announcer. Um, huh. And which brings me to, an, at the same time, an iconic announcer in the other two sports. Baseball was his third best sport, ironically, as an announcer uh, for Bill King. He was a, he was a uh-huh. masterful baseball announcer, but unbelievable in football and in, in uh, basketball. And the last question I'm going to ask you guys, I think about it often, they nickname out here the Warriors, the Dubs, for the Dubs. W's. The Dubs. <laughs> was that ever a nickname? George would know know best. He goes back further uh, than the rest of us um, in Washington. Um, were they ever nicknamed the Dubs or? Uh, a newspaper nickname, or I, I don't know about that. I, maybe Alan knows. I, I've never heard that as far as anything attributed to Washington. Uh, you know, the first in war, first in peace, last in American League. But you know, the the Dubs, I, I, I don't know. Yeah, uh, Dubs, Alan, have you heard that W um, thing? I don't. That's a never heard that. Uh, never heard. Be. Okay, I was just wondering if the Warriors stole it from, from Washington. <laughs> But, um, you know, I do want to mention one thing before we leave, and you, you talk about the Hall of Fame broadcaster. Uh, just recently passed away, and Alan would be Bob very Wolf. familiar yeah. with him. And, gave, and Bob uh, Wolf. Bob Wolf, yeah. And, and Bob was the longtime Washington announcer and, and was, uh, you know, involved in, in broadcasting up until uh, within a few months of his, of his passing, not, recent, not too recently. But, uh, Alan, uh, you just might want to talk about Bob Wolf for a second before we leave. Uh, sure. Uh, he was uh, obviously a broadcasting giant, uh, handling many different sports, as uh, Ralph just mentioned about Mr. King. Uh, one of the funny things was uh, when they were on the Today Show uh, early years and the senators had the singing senators, and uh, Bob Wolf uh, would lead them in song, a number of players, including Jim Lemon and Albie Pearson and Roy Seavers, all singing. And uh, they actually performed for uh, Roy Seaver's Day in 1957, the end of the season, uh, that uh, Bob Wolf uh, happened to uh, MC, and uh, Nixon gave uh, award and gifts to uh, Roy Seavers and his family. Uh, Nixon said that uh, Seavers was his uh, favorite player. Eisenhower uh, favored uh, Jim Lemon. Oh, really? Jim Lemon was, uh, oh, they always had power hitting outfield. It's Allison. Uh, yes, Killebrew. Well, they did. Uh, Washington had great power, when, when, and, and Allen will bear that out with Seavers, Lemon, Killebrew, and Allison. And, and when my dad played, they had virtually no right-handed power. And the, and the left field line at uh, Griffith Stadium was 407 feet, and then it was moved in, and all of a sudden uh, the what they called the beer garden was created, and Washington became a – uh, home run hitting, uh, you know, powerhouse in the American League with those four guys. And, um, you know, they turned the franchise from being a, you know, a small ball to a long ball uh, club because of the strength of the right-handed power with Seavers, Lemon, Killebrew, and Allison. And one last plug for uh, Roy Seavers on that. Locally, it was called Seversville in the left field uh, bleacher really? when, <laughs> they moved, when they moved it in. That's great. I did not know that. Uh-huh. And thank you, George, you. for the clarification on the the uh, Roy Seavers in the movie. And, Alan, you mentioned number two. That's a bit of trivia that they uh, – I did not know that Joe Hardy wore number two. And um, St. Louis Mo, incredible. Um, huh. Hey, this is – as they all are, this is a terrific show. I'm really enjoying you guys' Great. company. Yeah. Uh, Alan Feinberg, please come back soon. Thank and, you very much. It was a pleasure, right. Alan. And um, nice. Um, thank you for your twins analysis, uh, Mr. Rubin, Chad Rubin. Thank you. Of, you're fitting right in. This is pretty cool, isn't it? <laughs> He's doing it's a good job. He's yeah. his, Right. Um, I'm liking it on Sundays. Again, my apology for my tardiness. Um, 
it's a time difference, and the alarm uh, is on the wrong time invariably. <laughs> so here we are. Uh, we'll be back next week, and I just want to tell you guys to keep on keeping on and hang in there. And uh, thank you for listening, everybody out there. We'll see you next week. Yep. Thanks, thanks, thanks so much. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks, Bye-bye. Ralph. All right. Yeah. Bye-bye.